Ellis, and good evening to all our participants who are joining us from different parts of the world. I am Grace Jackson, the section head of sport and facilities at the UE St. Augustine Academy of Sport and one of four regional academies under the one UE Faculty of Sport headed by Dean Dr. Akshay Mansingh. I'm also quite proud to be Jamaica's first silver medalist in the 200 meters at the 1988 Seoul Olympics. Second, of course, to the Enigma, Flo Jo. And after 32 years, still able to own one of the top 10 times in the world and third in the Caribbean behind my teammates at the time, Merlin Otti and Jamaica's current sprint star, Elaine Thompson respectively. St. Augustine Academy of Sport in Trinidad and Tobago is in its infancy under the one UE Faculty of Sport. One of the aims of the Academy is to contribute to the building and sharing of knowledge based in sport, knowledge based in sport, which is relevant to both our Caribbean people and for the rest of the world to improve their knowledge of why as a region, we have so many that has continued, that has and continued to join the galaxy of stars worldwide in both summer and winter sports, even though our weather patterns give us warmth all year. So this evening, we have a panel of specialists with whom we will be continuing the discourse that we have started as a faculty with the intention of increasing the research material on sport available within the Caribbean. We look forward to an engaging and interactive night answering any questions you may have for, from any of the panelists. We therefore invite you to post your question in the chat and we will address them during the session. Our panelists are specialists in their field, working inside the Caribbean region over a number of years and would have identified peculiarities to us as a people. With that said, I would like to introduce our three speakers that will lead the discussion on the topic of sport injury, starting with Dr. Bayo. Dr. Saeed Bauer is a senior lecturer and the current coordinator of the Human and Nutrition Dietetic Program at the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, University of the West Indies at St. Augustine. He is a former associate professor at the Faculty of Human Nutrition, Warsaw University of Life Sciences in Poland from which he also attained his master's and his PhD degrees. Dr. Bauer is an active member of many nutrition organizations worldwide, including Community Nutrition and Chronic Non-Communicable Diseases of the United Nations, Standing Committee on Nutrition and Chairman, Chairperson of the Committee on Exercise and Sports Nutrition. He has authored and co-authored more than 100 journal articles, monographs and books, chapters, and is an expert reviewer of many food and nutrition journalists, journals. Next, Dr. Anil Gupisingh. Dr. Anil Gupisingh is a full-time sports and exercise medicine physician who graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and subsequently read for a Master of Science in Sports and Exercise Medicine in the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. He is a member of Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine, which is a joint faculty of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Dr. Gupi Singh works with the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee in the capacity of team physician to CAC Games, 
Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, World Championships in track and field, and many other regional meets. He is also a member of the WICB Medical Panel and also responsibility for performance enhancement. And our third panelist, Dr. Kevin Jones. Dr. Kevin Jones is an orthopedic surgeon whose academic training was through Princeton University and the University of the West Indies. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and has spent more than 30 years volunteering in various capacities in Jamaica within different sporting fraternities with a special love for track and field events where he, has won, he was once a participant. This voluntary participation has been happening parallel to his work life as a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Mandeville Regional Hospital and an assistant lecturer in the Department of Surgery, Radiology, Anesthetics and Intensive Care at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. He is also the president of the Jamaica Association of Sports Medicine. Dr. Jones, you were the last one that I introduced. And so therefore I'd like to, you to be the first one that we will start engaging in questions. Just want to share with our audience and with our panelists that Dr. Jones actually has just come out of theater and has joined us. So he continues to work, not just with athletes, but he works his regular job and he's doing that. We are happy to have all of you as panelists join us here this evening. Thank you for having us. So Dr. Jones, you are first up. With your vast experience in work and voluntary service in Jamaica, could you just share with us the most common injuries that you see recurring across sports in, um, and the tendency for which numbers are higher for athletes seeking care and what kinds of injuries? Okay, uh, well, again, thanks for having me. Uh, um, having me on your um, panel discussion, um, Ms. Jackson, um, and the Faculty of Sports, um, especially the Trinidad chapter. All right, well, in terms of um, the types of injuries that we see, generally, um, you can divide them into different categories based on either structural injuries or physiological injuries, or um, in terms of the time frame in which they occur. And that's usually the most common way that we do. So if um, an injury occurs at a particular point in time, and um, you're seen shortly after that, that's usually classified as an acute injury. That in, in the athlete was doing something, and something abnormal happens for them to damage a particular part of their body. Um, next, you have uh, more what you call chronic injuries, um, which occur as a result usually of repetitive activities that the athlete is engaged in, whether it is in training or in competition or in just um, if whatever it is that it is that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. In general, what we have seen, and this is just looking at like um like track and field is the most um I guess for us the most surveyed sport we have here in Jamaica. And we are members of our associates for a lot of time at the national high school championships as well as the senior championships and so forth. And the, um, in 2010, we kind of reviewed the information that we had collected from the different persons visiting the medical room. And we found that most of the injuries that we have are actually really chronic or overuse slash um, repetitive use type of activities. Um, acute injuries were not as common as you would think. They're more dramatic, but when most of the athletes come in, um, a lot of the acute injuries take place on the background of some kind of an of a chronic injury or um, a lot of the injuries that they present with are as a result of repetitive activities, whether they were be, would be in training or in, um, in the sport that they are competing in. Um, so that's just a general survey of what we have seen. And the issue with that is that um, with an acute injury, you, um, the treatment is 
kind of more direct and specific in terms of modifying your activities or your training to better be able to prepare to deal with the acute event that took place. But with repetitive use or chronic type injuries, they are harder to or more challenging to treat because they are as a result of activities that the athlete has to do in preparation for their particular event. And so um, in a lot of times you it, it involves really modifying of their training or doing um, in modifying their equipment to be them making them better able to cope with the repetitive activities that they need to do to continue to um, perform. Let me ask you something. Yeah, go ahead. There, there are a number oh. of persons that are that are viewing that might want to be able to understand the difference between, uh, you know, in terms of a real sin. Could you give us some examples of what you call an acute injury and what you call a chronic injury? Just a real life example of those, so that those who are the athletes who are listening could understand what category they would have fallen in or what they see other persons in. Category. All right, so, all right, so um, acute injury, in general, how uh, we like to look at injury and injuries as an injury is a failure of the body to cope with what's a particular stress that is put on it. And, um, and if you look at it from that way, then it's, you're better able to address the management of the injury by making the body better able to prepare it. So with an acute injury, that's usually when the body comes under a particular force or a set of activities which are um, specific at that time. So like if somebody is running in a race and then um, they suddenly grab their hamstring, um, that would be kind of end up with a hamstring pull, then that would be considered an acute injury. A chronic or, um, a, okay, a chronic injury in particular is like you could have had that acute hamstring injury which went on to heal and then um, or it didn't go on to heal properly. So you had an acute event, you've been treating it, you get to a place where you'll be able to compete again, but you're still having some symptoms like greater than six weeks after the acute event. That can be seen as a chronic, um, a chronic injury, something going on for a longer period of time or extended period of time outside of the time frame you'd expect it to heal. And then um, a repetitive use or what we used to commonly refer to as an overuse injury is when an athlete is involved in an activity over and over again. So like they're doing plyometrics or popping up a bunch of stairs or running hills or running on a hard surface like distance running, running um, getting miles on the road. So recurrent pounding on the ground can lead to repetitive stresses on the bones and the muscles and the muscle tendons, which in themselves wouldn't cause an injury by themselves. So when it occurs one time, it wouldn't cause an injury. However, with a repeated activity over an extended period of time happening every day, day in and day out, um, those forces or those deforming or damaging forces um, accumulate over time to the point at which it can cause some kind of a stress injury, just like a stress fracture in the bone or some chronic inflammation of the tendon, such as a tendonitis that you can get in Achilles tendonitis, which has affected a number of our senior athletes. You can also get it around the knee joint, I'm affected the muscle tendons around there. So that's kind of how you get it. So acute, an event happened, the um, structure has got damaged um, within a short period um, as the event happened. Chronic, you had an acute event, um, it's been treated, and then it is going on for a period. It doesn't heal adequately, and it goes on for a period of time, usually greater than six weeks. And then we call it a repetitive use, or, um, or what was commonly referred to in the past as an overuse injury. The reason why we don't like the term overuse is that you'll have 10 athletes doing the exact same thing, and say one or two of them might end up with this problem. So it's not like you're overtraining the athlete or the athlete is doing um, more than another athlete. It's just that for that athlete, um, their particular um, structure, biomechanics, et cetera, might be predisposed them to that injury from doing the same thing over and over again, so repetitively. What about uh, younger athletes? Uh, so you're talking about those who are probably in a system. You talked about the, the systems that exist. Um, when younger athletes, uh, maybe at uh, a prep, uh, you know, younger junior athletes, like at a prep school, a primary school level, um, 
many of the times they are not, uh, they don't necessarily have as organized a specific coach that deals with their specific sport, but they have physical education teachers, which are very knowledgeable, that will be able to apply their knowledge to help these persons come together and be exposed uh, to these sports. Would the same kind of process be applied to them? In their, in their initial stage of entering at that level. Okay, well, um, the same classification of the injuries would be in place for them. However, with um, the young or the junior athletes, so what we'd like to prefer, to, we'd like to refer to as the skeletally immature athletes. These are athletes who have open growth plates in their, um, in their bones, which allows them to get taller and wider in certain areas. These athletes present a particular a different dynamic. The issue is that with a, um, an athlete with an open growth plate, at the growth plates in the bone, the cells they are dividing more rapidly than they are elsewhere. And they actually, the, at that level in the bone, it's actually weaker than a lot of times, sometimes weaker than the muscles that's attached to them. You know, so like a lot of places where the muscles attach, um, they, they're um, like for the quadriceps muscles through the patella, um, through the kneecap and through the patella ligament on the, um, on the shin bone, right there is a common um, growth plate where you have a very powerful muscle that attaches there. Now, with the chill, with the skeletal immature, what happens with them as they grow, the forces that are exhibited at these growth plates are multiplying. As they grow, they're getting naturally bigger or heavier. And then also their bones are getting longer. So mm -hmm. remember that, um, the work done at the ear is um, equal to force times distance. If uh, you remember your moment arms. So the longer the lever arm is, and the more weight applied there is, the greater the force that is being applied there. So for, so for skeletal immature athletes, so the joint athletes that are growing during the course of a week, as they go along, the force that are being exhibited at these points of muscle attachments ligament attachment sections increases based on the fact that, that they are getting heavier, not by eating, just by growing, and that their lever arms, the force arm as it's being applied over um, is longer so that the force being applied at the site of attachment of the muscle or the ligament is greater. And that increases their risk of developing um, growth plate um, problems that is where you get irritation of the growth phase caused by this repetitive pulling there that is increasing over time as they get larger and, um, and taller or their limbs get longer. I'm going to come back around um, to you. I, I want you to think about what kind of advice you would be able to share with persons who are working with children at that level to be able to help them as they go through the process. But I'm going to move on to Dr. Gupi Singh and ask him about his own experience uh, in Trinidad and Tobago with, uh, so the same question apply, what are these common um, injuries that you see um, with the work that you're doing and, and what reoccurs across sports? Hi, Chris, good night, everyone. Um, thank you very much for allowing me this privilege of sharing some information. Um, and for that, I, I just have a few slides. I just wanted to just, you know, highlight a little bit about what, what, what I mean. So um, one of the things that we all along our life is an injury for uh, a, a normal recreational person in a day of life, um, someone who's popped their hamstring or, 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 or injured a ligament, their outcomes or, or that, that consequence of that injury is quite different for an elite athlete or recreational or developing athlete who a body needs to be perfect for them to achieve whatever goal they are, they are achieving, whether it's bowling a ball at 140 kilometers per hour or running 100 meter at, at, at sub-10 levels. And we know that Trinidad has a, a lot of great athletes who are all going to be running sub-10 at um, 100 meter times. Right, Dr. Jones? Um, just string a little <laughs> on, on, on our Jamaican colleagues there. Um, and and so for them, so for them, um, you know, we, we classify injuries in a very different dilemma. So we, we, we tend to classify them not on basis of, of time loss, but on any athlete who really requires some sort of medical attention. 
So this is just a little audit that I did, Grace, in 2013 and 14 in our World Championships track team. And there were 41, uh, there were 28 athletes, and there were 41 of those, of those 28 athletes, 40, there were 41 requests for medical attention. So we had, you know, I mean, and part of the reasons are also because they are all over the world training and, and they don't have access or finances to achieve their, their help. But we found a huge amount of, 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 of wide distribution of injuries. Um, but just like, you know, as Joseph said, almost 74% of them were chronic injuries. So they have been training and playing and, 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 and really pushing their bodies to a lot and, and really over time has had a, a recurrent injuries that just haven't you know, managed to succeed and, or be treated. Now, I always say, you know, yes, injuries can heal. We could do an injection or we could send them to the surgeons they can have the surgeries and everybody gets better. But, but why? But, but what, is, so then what is the real issue? Why are we so concerned about injury? So if a 100-meter sprinter who has a muscle tear where there's a, a huge space in the gap in the muscle, do we think that their performance is going to be the same? So studies have shown that, that if they have a hamstring injury, and when the hamstring starts to return to its function, there are changes in the way the hamstring function, there are changes in the way the hamstring is able to create forces. So almost forever, there's going to be a change in their body. And then what about other sports? So an elite cricketer who needs their ACL to be able to change directions and has an ACL injury. For them, that inability to change direction, whether it's cricket or football or, or, or netball, it, it's, it's a very significant injury. But what's also really very, very, very important and that we found out from work done by Ledbetter is that there's a period of time where through the injury cycle that there's almost a 20% loss of function. So if you think about, yes, we can treat injuries. Yes, injuries can be treated. But every time there's an injury, there's a potential for 20% permanent loss of function. And to me, that's, you know, after 20 years of seeing athletes train in day in, day out, give their heart and soul to training. I, I really have felt that we have spent a lot of time learning how to manage injuries, but not really how to pre prevent the injuries. Yes. And, I, and I felt that's a big part of what I want to do and figure out why are injuries happening? How are we going to change that process in them? You know? So along my research, I came across this particular process um, uh, of figuring out uh, of injuries. And one of the biggest models and most user-friendly models is, is this model by Ronald Barr and Crossberg in 2005. And it's a really simple model that combines all the risk factors for injuries. So for example, there are internal or intrinsic risk factors for injuries. So that's something within a, a person. Um, so for example, um, I, you know, an older person who might have be a little chubby like myself, who might not have the best cardiovascular fitness or strength would be at risk. And if I take that at-risk person, for example, and I add extrinsic factors, for example, I tell them to go run on an uneven grass track, or I tell them to run on a very wet mondo track, for example, um, where I add an extrinsic factor, and then I may have, you know, they may be, they may be in an environment where they've just traveled for 24 hours or 48 hours to run a, a race in the morning, missed a flight, slept in an airport, um, had no food or hydration, and then went to run the race because it's, it's a life-changing potential event, then all those things combine to create that injury. So along this way, you know, patients always say, Doc, you know, I have this hamstring injury. Is it because I didn't stretch? Is it because I didn't warm up? And the answer is that it could be yes, possibly, or it could be one of all of these factors that combine. And along this pathway then, it, it, it's made it even, even harder in a way for me to figure out how do we treat these injuries, you know? Um, so I'm going to stop sharing there for a bit so we can have some conversations about that. But a, a lot of what we've, what, what, I've, what we've tried to find out is how do we figure out how we're going to prevent these injuries? Absolutely. And, and, and so there you didn't, there's another sport that you have in Trinidad that you didn't talk about, which I think that you do very well on the international scene, which is cycling. And so before I even go on to the, the prepared question that I had for you, what is there any impact or is the impact on cyclists the same as it is for your footballers, your cricketers, your track athletes? I know I, I'm proud that you use track as the example all the time, because of course that's, that's my sport, but um, do those other sports have the similar um, 
injury or the rates of those injuries in the same way. So cycling, for example, which is typical, um, which does very well, um, the Trinidadians. So I think that, uh, that each sport has unique injuries. So football, you might find more, more knee and ankle injuries. Track and field tend to form more muscle specific, but also hip and groin. Cyclists tend to get a, a fair amount of, of low back injuries. And I think that's just because of the amount of gravitational force that they put through their, their riding, as well as to be an effective sprint rider. You spent, you spent hours and hours in that gym. And their strength and conditioning program is very, very well defined, but it's a lot of heavy power based lifting because power is what allows them to, to ride that truck very efficiently. So a lot of their injuries, not necessarily apart from the acute injuries of falling on a, off their bikes, per se, a lot of the injuries that we often see are from the gym and from lifting. You know? mm -hmm. uh, cricketers don't run more than, what is it, 80 meters between stumps? Um, I'm sure that Nadra would say to me. So we don't expect the, the cricketers to have a lot of injury, right? Because they're only running for a short time. Or those who are in the field might have to run a longer time. Do you find lots of similar injuries coming in for cricketers as well? We actually do, actually. So cricketers, traditionally, at least the trainer, based cricketers, initially found their success based on their talent. And, and, and then they evolved. So they, they got a little bit older. Their, their metabolic potential changed a little bit. They went to the IPLs where they found that the speed of the game changed dramatically. Um, and then they started to do, spend a lot of time in their strength and conditioning component of their life. Um, a lot more sprinting, a lot more, a lot more weight stuff. And, and that was the, 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 the comparison with an association with other strength-based injuries. What we find though is a lot of a lot of history, a lot of injuries in cricket have been specific to acute injuries for ball hitting helmets, ball hitting hands, a lot of finger and, 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 and shoulder injuries. Um, but in fast bowlers particularly, a lot has been written about stress responses at the back, which are chronic, repetitive, I won't say overuse, but overload injuries, where a load of that force of creating that, that power to, to, to bowl a cricket ball overwhelms the adaptive capacity of the muscles and the adaptive capacity of the bones to, to accept that load. And with that recurrent amount of energy required, kinetic energy to create that, that movement of a bowling action, um, and you combine that with some biomechanical factors, for example, they may have a mixed action or, or, or they may have abnormal front foot landing, for example, and they create all those intrinsic and extrinsic factors come together. So you have intrinsic factors where they may be having a little bit of core weakness or they may have um, inability in, in uh, poor gluteal strength, for example, we had extrinsic factors where the, the, their front foot landing may be abnormal. You know, we, a lot of that front foot landing, we see a lot of repairs happening. And then we add bowling too many overs or not bowling enough overs and all that contributes to that paradigm of, of creating an injury. Okay, and then I'm going to move now as I, I did with um, Dr. Jones, the younger generation. So. The younger generation, yes, they get to choose their sport. They get to decide, well, I don't want to do one sport and I want to do another sport. Do you find that you have of high injury um, situations with the younger generation or, do, or do, they, do you have more of them just doing it for fun so that they have less, you have less injury problems at, the young, at, at a younger age? And I wish I could tell you that our numbers are low. I wish I could say that. And one of the big things that I, I continue to do is my is career to track and field. Um, and, and one of the yeah. things is that if you look at the numbers of our career athletes and track and field every year, while our team gets smaller and smaller, our injury mm -hmm. numbers rise. And that's just because it potentially number factors again. But a big part of that, we are, our young people are mm -hmm. specializing maybe a bit too early. I, I definitely think that when you look at track athletes, the, the younger track athletes should be doing the multiple sports, sprints, hurdles, jumps. Um, uh, you know, they, they should not just be specifically doing um, 100 meters or sprints versus middle distance or whatever. But when you ask them, what, what, what do they do? Well, I'm a 100, 200 meter runner. I said, so well, you know, speed endurance happens Everybody. if you're running 400. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you do some jumps, you get better coordination. If you do some hurdles, your hip and groin gets protected. But no, we super specialize in the Caribbean because we don't train to, yes. to train, we train to compete. So we have 11 year olds and 12 year olds focusing on competition rather than training for development. Until we change that concept of training for development, I think we'll always have high number of injuries in our youths. You know? mm -hmm. Another sport that does very well in training that is 
volleyball. So, you know, we tend to, when we talk about sport, we tend to talk about the outdoor ones much more than we talk about the indoor ones. So the volleyballs and netballs and the basketballs usually, um, you know, don't, you know, you don't, you know, don't spend as much attention. So again, the question that I pose to you um, in the position from which you sit, do you see uh, a high state of injury with volleyballers, with basketballers, with netballers coming out of Trinidad? Yeah, we do. So volleyballers get huge amounts of, of rotator cup dysfunction injuries. Um, yes, you have your acute ankle sprains, but we see a lot of, of that shoulder. So they get increased, increased range of movement in their shoulder from an early age, um, something called GERD. And, and that internal rotation deficit does change that shoulder function. So yeah, we're always assessing shoulders. Um, our basketballers, their knees and their patella tendons. Um, Trinidad has some good courts, but also they play a lot of basketball on concrete courts. Um, mm -hmm. With all that, that, that cushioning, spring effect of the ground, the ground reaction forces are high. And it, it just goes up their kinetic chain. It goes from their toes to their knees, their hips, their back. Uh, you see a lot, of, a lot of injuries. And our injury prevalence is way too high. And I think, you know, we just have to set as a team. And, and part of this enjoyment of discussing and seeing what other doctors are doing and and Grace, what your faculty is doing is a way for us to, to get information out to change that dilemma, mm -hmm. to, to reduce that risk of injury. I'm going back to the kids now, because one of the things um, some parents will ask, or they will say, because of what you just said, oh, I want to be a hundred runner. I want, you know, nobody wants to go anything further than a 200. They might try the 400. So uh, in support of what the children wants to do, um, sometimes the parents want to put them in the weight room and says, okay, we need to get you strong and we need, to, we need you to build up your muscles so that you can run faster. Um, is that advised at a young age or what age would that, you would we say that we'd want um, young people to start doing weights? So strength training can happen from as early as eight, nine. So traditionally, the, our history was that if you're a skeletal immature athlete, as Dr. Jones talked about, open air physical plates, don't go lift, you're going to get shorter, you're going to be a dwarf forever. But what we know in the skeletal immature athlete, we start by using body weight, for example. We focus on the initial strength and conditioning components of that is to, to learn about form and function. So how to do a squat, how to do an overhead lift, using body weights, it progresses to resistance bands. And as they get competent, and then newer muscular components develop, so the nerve and muscle and strength and able to do it properly, then you add weights. And, and it's a slow loading process and you make those, those strength and conditioning stuff in the gym functionally strong by doing um, you know, things like hops and pyrometric exercises. So strength can happen from day one, it's just what you do. And the key component is always function, form and function. Right. So you don't necessarily want them in the gym lifting the weights, but you want them in the gym doing other things. Correct. Right. Dr. Jones, I want to come back to you a bit um, because as you see, I have spoke to Dr. Gopi, Gopi Singh extensively uh, in much detail about other sports. Uh, your experience, um, we, we again, we tend to talk about the, out, the, the, the sports that are outside um, and we don't talk much about the inside. Netball, for example, is one of the top sports in Jamaica, um, are, there, are there injuries that they get um, different? And the other thing is, do they do enough pre-preparation uh, like maybe, you know, I have to use track and field because track and field just, um, they start very young and they, they do a lot of, they do background work before they get into their season, etc. cetera. Um, do the sports in Jamaica that, um, position themselves um, internationally, that do they have that extensive program of, of working out and how does that impact um, the, the amount of times they come to visit you or not visit you? All right, well, just to endorse a couple of things that Dr. Gopasig had said, um, early specialization is not good and not recommended. Um, and the reason why I did that is I mean, I could go to that another time, but it is not recommended. And actually, at times, studies from the National Basketball Association in the States and Major League Baseball in the States have shown is that um, athletes who participate in multiple sports growing up 
um, their careers lasted longer and they had less injuries during um, the season. So they played more, they missed less games as a result of injuries and they lasted longer in the professional ranks. So we do encourage um, participants in multiple sports and multiple events while they are developing because it helps to develop a lot of um, it helps to develop a lot of muscles that help to comp um, help to um, complement the muscles that they use in their primary sport. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as you're talking about it, it was like netball. I know that they have undergone um, some changes in terms of the preparation. I see a lot more netball as in the weight room. And um, in their preparations, I see them in the pool and so forth. I think so I know they have tried to improve their background development and so forth. The issue with us, I guess, in um, the developing countries on a whole, is that for a lot of our athletes, um, especially in sports that cannot um, support them financially, a lot of them work and end up doing a lot of stuff. So it is difficult for them to prepare for their sports. Um, before they go into like major competition, like training that takes place um, in preparing for like major competition, a lot of it is done after work and so forth. You know, so that um, plays into the plays into it. Now, the thing too as well is that for women, remember that for women, there are certain injuries that occur around the knee, in particular to like their anterior cruciate ligament and other ligaments in their joint. That um, it's 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 higher in women. And they think it might be because of the smaller size of the knee joint and so forth and thing. And then people tell that actually concussions in women the, um, is a higher rate in women than in men. So for our netballers, what we have seen a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of um, cruciate ligament injuries in our netballers. And several of them that are um, in residency, but as in Kingston, we operated on um, and they went back, returned to play. Some of them actually had both knees done and so forth. So you get a lot of ligament injuries um, a lot around the knee, around the ankle. And um, remember that for us, we don't have our netballers, we mostly train on a hard surface, you know, concrete surface. They don't play, they don't get to train although it's an indoor sport. They tend not to be able to train on the indoor surface um, for extended period of time, especially those outside of Kingston. They're training on And an asphalt surface or a concrete surface and that um so they end up with like stress fractures um um shin spins what we call anterior tibial stress syndrome and stuff like that and they, and then tendonitis around the knee joint for all the most um the patella tendon and then the quadriceps tendon um, they end up with um issues around the knee joint as a result of that so i know that i guess i know that they have tried to improve their preparation for Competition and so forth, there's a background getting to the weight room and so forth, but I'm not sure how extensive that has been for the wider group of netballers, given now um, the diet, the specifics for or for well, I guess not just for Jamaica, but for developing countries in terms of being able to have everybody um, in like a um, some facility where they can live, eat, sleep, train, and prepare for their sport for an extended period of time. Most of them are brought in for camps closer to an event and so forth. And then the training that they do otherwise takes place with their club, which in like in Jamaica, a lot of our um, major clubs are rural. And they talk about like um, the extrinsic factor Dr. Gupa Singh was talking about um, training on asphalt surface for a sport that is played on a suspended board or um, surface. We are, we, are, we are engaged with our audience as well. And so they have questions as well. So one of the question is, what is the role of resistance training in helping injury prevention in skeletally immature athletes? Well, again, I, I'd like to back up, uh, back up a thing here as well. Um, so resistance work and weight training in skeletally immature athletes is, is fine. I mean, it's just how you do and watch and it's how you do it and um, what kind of programs you put them on. The issue I had mentioned earlier with skated immature athletes is because they are growing, their limbs are getting longer and they're getting heavier. Each week, from week to week, the force that they're exerting on their joints increases just by being alive. So a child who doesn't lift just by being alive and growing, every year they get stronger just by working against their, their increasing body weight or the increasing weight of the limbs and increasing length of the limbs. And that's what I'm um, saying. Um, the increase in the length of the lever arm. So 
we encourage resistance work in skating and maturities, more so to get them prepared for when it becomes time for them to lift heavier weights. So it's good that they learn how to do the exercise. So if they're like they're bench pressing, they're not doing a whole lot of weight. So we don't encourage them to max out. So we don't encourage max, like you try to see like the maximum weight they can use in a skate and immature athletes. That's almost a sure way to end up with some kind of an abortion injury. But the resistance work should be gradual. So every two weeks or so, you like you start off with the body weight and then you even go to weight training every two weeks or so you might increase the weight by five, 10 pounds and you go up like that in a stepwise fashion. So it's almost as if the child is, well, it's as if it's just a part of their natural growth. You know, and they will get stronger just by doing that. You don't have to try and get them to do some maximum weight and see what the most weight they can do with one rep. And then you stagger their program from there. You just start, start off with a weight and then you work up from there. And it should never be that they are struggling or forcing themselves to try and lift um, a weight that is hard to manage, you know, because that's a sure way for them to end up with uh, pulling the muscle off of the bone or some, or um, just um, damage, significantly damage a ligament or something like that. So it is important, but it's how you do it. And we recommend graduation with uh, minimal increases in the resistance that you do. And, that, and the reason being, like I said, they're getting heavier and their lever arms are getting longer. So the force that they're exerting are increasing from week to week as they grow without even increasing the, the um, actual weight that they're lifting. Okay. I, I think that's a good segue point for me to kind of turn to the nutritionist now, because I'm sure nutrition has a lot to do with um, young persons as the, you know, all the things that you have just described. And so I want to take the opportunity to bring um, Dr. Saeed Bauer in the conversation now, because nutrition is very, very important to, you know, an athlete and, you know, what an athlete does and 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 we we continue across the Caribbean that we know how we tie both of yam and and it's even when they say that um what it is that comes out of that so um you know different diff, diff, different ones of the Caribbean islands they tend to have um, things that grow naturally in the country, uh, but we don't know how, how to use that, that value to, to encourage the athletes in a way. Many of us don't know. Um, and so you are here to now help us and talk to us a little bit about the impact of nutrition on even some of these injuries that we're talking about and what some of the things that we can use. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I welcome to all the participants. Um, uh, nice, uh, nice to be here. So, uh, first of all, I will have a short presentation on the significance of diet and nutrition in the prevention and management of uh, sport uh, injuries. Uh, this should lead us into uh, discussion. So, uh, first of all, what, what to expect? Uh, of course, the importance of nutrition, uh, once again, in the prevention and management of injury and all healing from surgery, because sometimes athletes have to undergo surgery. And of course, uh, there will be some guidance for athletes in emitting their uh, energy, uh, macronutrient, I mean, uh, uh, protein, fat, uh, and carbohydrate, as well as micronutrient, uh, vitamins and minerals uh, via diet. And uh, of course, uh, this should help uh, them to return very fast uh, to play after uh, injury. So uh, first of all, what are the goals of an injured athlete? As you are all aware, after an injury or surgery, one of the primary goals of athletes is to be able to heal as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, uh, trainers and coaches uh, have different ways of uh, managing these injuries via rehabilitation. Unfortunately, in this process, nutrition uh, 
quite often uh, is not taken into consideration. And before I move uh, forward, uh, you, you must understand that um, we are what we eat. Our chemical composition reflects what is there on the plate. So nutrients are really needed to speed up the healing process. So uh, by undermining nutrition or diet, uh, this will uh, sort of, I mean, delay the healing uh, process. So I will concentrate mainly on whole foods and not supplements, but because unfortunately, most of you know that most athletes associate nutrition with, with uh, tablets and powders instead of uh, real, real food. And uh, uh, whole foods offer the best nutrition. And as uh, Grace mentioned uh, here in the Caribbean, you have different varieties of uh, sweet potatoes, which are excellent uh, in boosting performance. And apart from that, of course, uh, you grow different types of uh, legumes, which uh, supply uh, good uh, protein that are needed. And apart from that, dietary fiber, which will uh, I will talk about uh, later. So first of all, we have to think about energy requirement. What happens if an athlete uh, get injured? Uh, there will be an increase in his or her energy requirement. It uh, goes up by about uh, uh, 20, 20%. So what I'm saying is this, uh, intensive training of course, uh, increases someone's energy requirement. So if the, uh, if the athlete is injured, he should not eat as much as if he is training but uh, he should not also eat as if he is sedentary. So uh, we take into account his sedentary lifestyle and add 20% of the energy requirement when he is sedentary, and that should help up uh, speed up uh, the process of uh, uh, injuries. So for example, here, for example, if, if uh, a person requires about 2000 uh, kilocalorie calories during a typical with no ex uh, I mean typical day with no exercise, uh, his or energy requirement will go up by about 2,400 after a minor surgery or minor injury. So meeting this particular energy requirement should help uh, speed up uh, I mean the, the, the management of those injuries. Uh, we go now to protein. Uh, injury repair requires more protein. And uh, basically, we recommend for athletes consumption of between 1.5 uh, to uh, uh, 2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight when they are injured. This is um, uh, uh, compared to the lower amount, about 1.2 to 1.7 when uh, they don't, when they are not injured. And of course, that higher requirement also uh, refers to recreational exercises. Their muscles, damaged muscles have to be repaired. They also require higher protein uh, intake. And the next thing we should understand, which is very important for this protein to help in the healing process, it should be distributed evenly throughout the day. So each meal should have between 20 to 30 grams of protein, rather than backloading the protein during uh, dinner, which is common in many cultures, uh, even here in, in the Caribbean, right? Uh, too much of that protein is left during di dinner. That will not help uh, the healing process. So remember, once again, distribute the protein intake evenly, right? Each meal should have between 20 to 30 grams. So uh, from the practical point of view, uh, that would be three eggs or one cup of cottage cheese 
could be one cup of uh, Greek yogurt, uh, could be uh, the three to four ounces of meat, poultry or fish, and could be two thirds of uh, 14 ounce cake of firm tofu. That is for those who are vegetarians or uh, 1.25 cups of uh, black beans, lentils, or other uh, legumes. Now we quickly move into branch chain amino acids. They are really quite important. They, uh, they have been shown clinically to help in the healing process after musculoskeletal injury or surgery. And the branch chain amino acids, particularly leucine, uh, has have been shown to speed up the synthesis of protein as well as to stop protein breakdown, uh, which is quite important if you want to uh, speed up the uh, healing process. And again, athletes usually want to get their branch chain amino acids from supplements. No, you don't have to. Branch chain amino acids you can find out in, in chicken breast, uh, beef, tuna, salmon, uh, turkey breast, eggs, and, and peanuts. And talking about um, the different types of protein, uh, usually immediately after exercise, when we know injury has happened and we want to stop protein breakdown, we recommend consumption of whey protein because it is easily digested. Within 30 minutes, you have an increase in the level of amino acids that will stop protein breakdown, but will speed up protein synthesis, which should help uh, speed up uh, uh, the management of injuries. And at night, we recommend consumption of casein because it is slowly digested. Mm -hmm. When you are asleep, then the amino acids are gradually uh, being released into circulation. So throughout the night, you will have amino acids available uh, to speed up protein, protein synthesis and to manage uh, the healing uh, process. Of course, uh, carbohydrates are important. Uh, for athletes, we usually recommend uh, five to 12 grams uh, of carbohydrates per kilogram body weight. And of course, uh, uh, when an athlete is not training intensively, we, re we recommend the lower value. This is to help in the prevention of weight gain. Otherwise, during intensive training, they can consume up to 12 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight, particularly male athletes. Uh, female athletes up to 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram, per kilogram body weight. And of course, the quality of carbohydrate is quite important. And this comes in the sweet potatoes I'm telling you about. It's very, very nice. It has uh, characterized by medium glycemic index, does not spike your glucose, does not spike your insulin, so you have slow release of the glucose, which should help boost performance, supply you with energy all the time. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we cannot talk about that in terms of yams, the dashi, or the idos. Unfortunately, as I'm saying, they are characterized by high glycemic index. They spike your glucose. So you have to be careful how much of of them you you consume, and one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, foods I recommend for athletes within the Caribbean region is breadfruit. It's another excellent food uh, with a high quality uh, protein, uh, particularly uh, certain certain uh, varieties of of the I mean uh, of the uh, uh, a bread breadfruit, but not all of them have high quality quality uh, protein. And of course, breadfruit is characterized by low glycemic uh, index. So that should help uh, not only with speeding up the healing process, but also in boosting exercise performance. 
And um, you, we all know that um, uh, whenever there is muscle damage, whenever there is an increase uh, in muscle temperature, this brings about inflammation. And one of the things you want to uh, do is to eat anti-inflammatory foods uh, that would fight uh, that, that inflammation and speed up the recovery uh, process. So definitely uh, water soluble fiber, which is fermented by the good bacteria in us, uh, leads to the formation of what we call the short chain fatty acids, which we quite know they, act, they have anti-inflammatory activity. Likewise, the good bacteria, right? The good bacteria that ferment the dietary fiber also have anti-inflammatory uh, activities. So, and of course, uh, the next thing uh, uh, shortly before I, I finish the presentation is talking about vitamins and minerals. The most important thing to concentrate on are the antioxidant vitamins and minerals because whenever there is muscle damage, delayed onset of muscle soreness, whenever there is, that occurs, there is inflammation and inflammation creates uh, free radicals. So consumption of antioxidant minerals and vitamins should help in the removal of these uh, free radicals Otherwise, if they are not, uh, the process of healing will take uh, quite a long time. Now, there was a mention of uh, bone, bone injuries, fractures. So whenever there are fractures, what we recommend are foods that are high in vitamin D and calcium. And of course, you all know that uh, dairy products are the best sources of, uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of calcium. Uh, if somebody is uh, lactose intolerant, what we recommend is uh, consumption of fermented dairy products where you have lower content of the lactose. And uh, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, bone, bone injuries, as I said, vitamin D. Here, we live in a tropical country, taking supplements does not make sense. It's enough to expose the skin to sunlight for about 30 minutes, three times in a week, and your body will produce sufficient amount of vitamin D that you don't have to buy supplements. And uh, you all know that we can easily exaggerate with supplements because of their higher amount. So uh, that brings me to, um, uh, uh, in a short presentation, which I said should lead to a kind of discussion, uh, taking questions, of course, uh, from our participants. So uh, thank you for listening to the presentation. We're, we're not hearing you. Oh, okay. No, you can yeah. hear me, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, really, really thorough presentation. Uh, as I listen to you talking, I can I can picture the, the parents of all of those young people, uh, children who don't want to eat the foods that their parents are giving them. Really saying, you hear what the man said? <laughs> you know. In other words, you know, you're, you've spoken to so much of what we have around us and how we use it. Um, and the question that I'd, I'd like to ask you before I look at some of the other questions is, as, an, as a former athlete myself, um, I didn't like, I didn't eat a lot. I didn't weigh much as well, uh, but I didn't eat a lot. And so there was really a need for me to be able to take my regular vitamins because Although everyone would insist that, yes, you need to eat. I did not have a great desire to have all of this wonderful food that you said we must eat at a particular time in the day, et cetera. And so the, the life of an athlete starts by taking 
vitamins, um, not necessarily natural ones, the vitamins, because not liking the taste of food, et cetera, but needing the nutrients to be able to perform. What advice could you give to these parents who are experiencing that with this, with these possible upcoming stars, but at the early stages of their lives, they really don't like to hear what you have said about all of this food that they're supposed to eat that they don't like. How do you advise those parents? Well, uh, my advice is, I mean, um, sometimes, sometimes you have to experiment with children. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that you have to try new dishes. It could be that the diet or uh, the meals prepared at, at home have become monotonous for the children. So uh, trying new dishes, uh, right? Uh, some new, uh, initi uh, new initiations, right? New initiatives. And uh, of course, uh, this should uh, kind of um, help, help the children uh, to try these new foods. Uh, they, 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 might, they might like it. And um, <laughs> all I can say to the parents uh, or to the children themselves uh, is that uh, we should regard our diet as a kind of symphony, right? So where, I mean, there has to be interaction, right? <laughs> okay. Right, exactly. And the conductor, they are leading it. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So by taking single pills, you are ruining the symphony, right? So uh, on the plate there, you have different nutrients that act differently. And of course, uh, they try to uh, uh, prevent, uh, prevent uh, diseases and of course, uh, boost performance and speed up uh, uh, the, 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 the recovery process. Right. I, I, I won't I won't I want to kind of bring Dr. Jones in this discussion because you know when 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 athletes are having injuries, sometimes you they might be told you need to load up on your carbs. Dr. Jones, you heard the, the presentation from Dr. Bauer. Um, how do you rate that or how do you link that now in a real sense being underground, seeing an injured athlete? Um, how do you take what Dr. Bauer just said now, this, this wonderful food that he's producing that only those of, those of us who have reached my age will now appreciate it, but not necessarily appreciate it at a very young age. How do you work with that athlete in being able to, to convince them, as Dr. Bauer said, that this is natural and you can use and reduce the, the use of the external things, um, the synthetic external things? Well, um, excellent presentation by Dr. Bauer. I um, agree with a lot of what you had to say. And we do have a lot of natural things here which are really good. Um, complex carbohydrates that we grow and so forth, which are recommended um, for, for, for use um, in preparation for sport. And um, I mean, something as simple like, like bananas, which ironically are mocked. I do understand when they um, they, they, they use it as a black thing, you know, the, um, the most <laughs> the bananas, but there is no high performance athlete that I know, whether it be a tennis player, triathlete, um, who doesn't have bananas in their thing. Cyclists, when on the road, they all have bananas, right? Bananas are a huge part of adequate nutrition for training and for competition. Um, and so, in terms of like the timing as well, what he says is, is really important. We, you, you usually want to have all of these things in place before you go to your hard training or have like some kind of a protein meal within an hour after a workout, especially an intensive workout. Um, that is when the muscles are most receptive for um, absorbing all these nutrients and putting them to use. And so what um, I actually recommend to a lot of athletes and so forth, and this goes not apart from our natural stuff, but if they must during workouts, like if you can't eat, some people can't eat and work out, some people can't do it. I mean, and eat simple things like bananas and so forth and other fruit. Um, 
to inter along with your hydration fluids, like with water, your Gatorade, your electrolyte mixes and so forth, you can have like a protein shake with you during the workout, whether that be a natural protein shake where you can blend like oats and um, ripe bananas for flavor and so forth and thing, and you sit that during the workout so that the nutrients and so forth that are available there, um, peanuts and so forth, so that you blend up together, um, is available to you when you need it during the workout so your body doesn't have to be going to stores to get these um, for the muscles to get these nutrients to function but you are taking them in as you are working out and then you consume them um like say immediately after me that or after you continue to sit them so you're not asking you to eat a whole meal or to drink like a whole shake down no, but during the workout and right after you just keep sipping just just like how you're sipping hydration fluid you put a little bit in your mouth and you sip it and that will help to reduce um cramps during the workout it will provide enough energy during the muscles that when they are lifting heavy weights that um the muscles don't feel because of a lack of energy molecules within them you know um and um and maintain relevant muscle stores of energy during a workout especially for high intense workouts so fully endorse it um and like i said if you have an issue with the fruits and so on i think then like a simple protein drink. Um, there are many on the market that you can buy off the shelf. Um, some powder forms you can mix and use, but um, if you can, like I said, mix, blend up your oats, your ripe banana, your peas, whatever it is, to get that natural protein shake and sip it while you work out, it goes a long way into ensuring that you have a great workout and that your muscles are optimum while they are on the, being loaded. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kevin Jones, for bringing in uh, the bananas, uh, particularly particularly green bananas. Uh, what mm -hmm. I recommend, um, either the green bananas or the, the green yellow bananas, so half ripe, um, in the sense that um, they are a good substrate. They are a good food for the good bacteria. Because as I told you, the, the good bacteria help to fight inflammation. Sometimes athletes just go and buy the bacteria. Bacteria is, uh, when you buy the bacteria, it's, it's just like uh, having, I mean, uh, pets. It's not enough to have a pet, but you have to take care of the pet, right? So uh, <laughs> by ingesting the good bacteria, you need to have substrate. You need to have food for them. There comes in the green bananas or the uh, uh, half ripe bananas. And of course, there are other, uh, we, call, we, we call the food for the bacteria prebiotics, right? So apart from bananas, uh, of course, you, you have the garlic that, that, is, that is there. Mm. And you have uh, vegetables of the onion family in general uh, are really good in stimulating the number of the, uh, of, of the good, good bacteria. So I don't know if I can answer one question I saw, uh, Grace, about calcium. Sure, please go ahead. Please go ahead. And I'm going to bring Anil after this. Um, yes, okay. go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw a question regarding uh, what are the best sources of calcium. And at the same time, somebody was disagreeing with me that dairy products are not uh, the good sources of uh, calcium. So uh, definitely uh, dairy products mm -hmm are uh, good sources in the sense that the, uh, the, the content of the calcium is very high, right? One cup, one cup of uh, uh, milk will give you more than 300 milligrams of the calcium. So you rarely find a food that will give you that amount of calcium, except the Moringa, which I think uh, you have in your backyards there, right? Uh, yeah. And, um, and, uh, but we have to remember about uh, the availability of the calcium is important. That's what, what, what we call bioavailability. Mm. What, is, what the body takes to repair the damaged tissue, the calcium. So if you are talking about bioavailability of the calcium, only about 30% of the calcium in milk is absorbed. But the bioavailability of calcium from vegetables of the cabbage family is more than 50%. But the content in the, uh, of calcium in the vegetables of the cabbage family is lower, right? So 
that is the that is the uh, the difference right bioavailability higher when you eat your cabbage or the calcium but you have to eat much more as compared to when you have when you have to drink just one cup of uh, one cup of milk to have your 300 milligrams and of course fortified uh, fortified uh, uh, soybean beverages you know uh, you know uh, uh, companies that that produce soy milk at uh, uh, calcium sulfate to eat and calcium sulfate is highly bioavailable so talking about uh, those who are vegetarians and don't consume uh, dairy uh, products. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say about the calcium. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to move on. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on to um, Dr. Gupi Singh because I know that people in Trinidad love their cassava, right? So cassava, um, they might take it with a lot of oil in different instances. So that might not be as good, but can you tell us, uh, you, you, I know that you also have done work in nutrition as well. So can you tell us, I, 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 I'm talking about cassava, but you probably know more foods or fruits in Trinidad that could be really a great support for parents in helping their children to eat better as they take that stand to become great athletes. You're muted. So can I mute myself? Yes. So thank you very much. Yes, so that's why I would totally enjoy that, that sharing and education. So this is what I tell our young people. Um, if you want to be an elite athlete, you're overtaking an elite car. So you're a Ferrari, a Lamborghini. Um, if you are going to drive a Ferrari, you're not going to put diesel petrol into, into the car. You're going to make sure the car has the best gas, make sure the car has the best oil, make sure the filters are the best, make sure you have the best tires. So what you eat contributes to that oil and fuel that you're putting into your car. Now, one of the biggest things about nutrition that I have found in my life is about total nutrition. So total calories plays a huge role for making sure that our young and developing athletes have an appropriate amount of energy to, to, to produce their task of life as well as training. There's something called relative energy deficiency in sport. It's called REDS. Um, and what it means is that you use all your energy for training and not for your metabolic growth. So you have issues with menstruation in women, issues with bone health in, in, in men and women, and it really has a significant uh, ill health components to not consuming calories. And we find them in gymnasts, we find them in, in, in some swimmers, in, in, even in sprinters who are worried about body composition. Mm -hmm. The next thing about nutrition, Grace, is that nutrition takes a lot of planning. What we eat today is what we're going to, today will affect what we go, how we're going to train tomorrow or the day after. Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of different ways that people have been doing it. They're training low carbohydrates, training with high carbohydrates for power-based interventions, it's a lot of periodization of, of how we eat and what we eat and when we eat. So, for example, some football teams now will not have Gatorade available on their side track for that training session because they want to utilize stored fats as their fuel and only use carbohydrates in certain high-intensity power-based um, and skill-based training sessions. So there's a lot of periodization of how we eat. An important part is that a lot of our foods are naturally available. For example, we know that nitrates are really good for, for, for short-term intermittent sprints. And we find a lot of nitrates in our cassavas and our dashings, for example. You know, we, we talk about intramuscular buffers and everybody wants to buy beta alanine, but there's intramuscular carnosine that's available in, in our oily fish like salmon, which we have available in Trinidad, for example. Um, I think the biggest challenge that I face in, in, in a lot of Trinidad, Trinidad and young developing athletes is that they are, they are, we are all athletes trying to be pro athletes, but living a life of a normal student. Mm -hmm. So we're going to school, we're going to university, and we just don't have the time to prepare our food. So supplementation becomes an important part of that. The challenge with supplementation, and, and, and like I say that without a miss, is that there's a 4% risk of contaminated supplements in any supplement to be buy off the shelf. So unless at that particular supplement is batch tested by informed choice or informed sport, any supplement that we buy off the shelf in a pharmacy carries a potential risk of a positive test. And 
as any athlete has the role of strict liability. What they put into their body is what is their role and their responsibility. You know, Jamaica had a, had a well-established international case, Dr. Jones, where a, a case was made that that particular athlete, you know, was, was, was under parental guidance and was, was, was you know, really allowed and, and very fortunate to be in that position. But in reality, strict liability adheres to all athletes. What they put in is their responsibility. So supplementation is really great, has a role, but must be safely adhered to by making sure that each supplement is batch tested and safe. Mm -hmm. Those are my little two cents to add to that great presentation of Tabawa. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question. With all of that said, I mean, listening to what we've talked about injuries um, and, and, and the impact of injuries on these athletes, and we have now talked about food, how can we create what is needed so that at all levels, from your starting from the young ones to help the parents to be able to get that guideline leading on to the, the levels of those who might have missed up the early nutrition. And then even to the, the ones that are already gone international, but they are depending on the, 28 tablets to take so that they can have what they need to run fast. And when I say the 28 tablets, it could be 28 different vitamins, all kinds of vitamins that you can't even pronounce their names, right? But they're taking all of these things because they have been told that this is what's going to make them strong and healthy and it's legal. And, and so we are always on that board of that, that. Is there an alternative? And if so, one, you know, how can we present that alternative so that it can be accessible by those who would need it to be able to become champions in their respective sports without going to something that is going to have some sort of negative effect on them later on in life or even during their process of sport. Because if they do something that is not allowed based on the rules and regulations, then they're out. So how can we help them to use the natural things that we have mm -hmm. to be able to move forward and still be on top of the world? Should I start with you, Dr. Jones? Well, I'm uh, going to start with Dr. Bob. Um, uh, yes, I really should. That's but, uh, true. But, um, <laughs> the bottom line is that um, what, and this is well documented by nutritionists, by the IWF, you no know, World Athletics, and other uh, sporting bodies. That once you eat or consume a balanced diet, there is no need for supplements. No, the critical point is um, that balanced diet. Are you sure that your child, or whoever it is that is eating, consume that balanced diet? No. If they're not, then you're going to need to find ways to augment that diet. And this goes for children, not just involved with sport, but otherwise, I had a, I have a niece and when she was small and growing up, um, her pediatrician had to, had to um, recommend protein shake for that. Sounds like he's frozen for a little while. <laughs> All right, until he unfreezes, um, Dr. As you really wasn't eating, if however you're unable to, whatever reason, whether the financial um, time constraints or circumstance, whatever it is, then you might have to find, need to find ways to augment that, whether you try to bring it in with natural foods or you might have to reach out for some type of a reputable um, supplement that you can have. But, but I think the question always come back, Dr. Jones, is can, can persons that really don't have the financial means afford what we are talking about? Is, is, it, is, 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 is what we are talk, is it that what we are talking about is above the means of our, our persons or is it that we just don't know where it is? What, what is that? I, I think it's that we just don't know because I mean, we're blessed in the Caribbean to be to have a lot of natural foods. Dr. Bob makes it in his, in his talk. Um, the sweet potatoes, the breadfruits, you know, um, the yams and so forth. 
It's just that a lot of times um, the young people don't necessarily like the food, you know, and it's one thing I try to get in the head of athletes, like when we travel and we go overseas to meet or events and they don't like the food there. I say, well, that's understandable you don't like the food, but you need to consume the necessary nutrients for you to be able to compete. Mm -hmm. So you need to find your proteins, your vegetables, that's what you will eat to get you through the meat. You don't have to like it, but you need to consume it to get through. And um, so I think for us here, like I said, we have a lot of natural um, um, fruits and vegetables that can provide all the required um, nutrients that we need. A lot of them we can actually grow at home. You know, the kalaloo and other vegetables like that, that we can actually grow by ourselves, by ourselves to provide the, rel the relevant nutrients it is to perform at that level. It's just a lot of times, especially with children, they might not like it. And um, as a result of that, that's where the hard part comes in, making it palatable enough for them to enjoy it, you know, get them used to such foods. You know, so um, that is really where the challenge comes in, a lot of them um, gravitate towards fast foods, that's what, which are high in salt and, and, um, and saturated fats, that's what, which are not necessarily good for them, but they enjoy that more. And, uh, but yeah, we do have all the right things available. It's just a matter of, of using them accordingly. So, uh, Dr. Bauer, it looks like we are going to have to um, invite you to be an athlete then so that you can help to develop for our, our Caribbean people. All of these options, I mean, you know, I know, as I said, I know that Dr. Goop is saying as well, delves somewhat into the nutrition area of, uh, of medicine. So I think what we need to be able to do is to, to, to be able to give more information. I mean, it's one thing for us to know it here and we are talking about it in this fair. And, you know, I'm really thankful for all the persons who are tuning in so that they can gain that knowledge. But I think the knowledge should be just as easy that when persons know that they go in and they buy Gatorade, this is what Gatorade has. How can we create, you know, the question is, can, as we move forward, I mean, so this is, this is, this is where we are now. We're talking about it and, and we have that we can use without going into all of these other, <laughs> the other areas. Uh, your role, sir, in um, and and thought process. I know you you might not have necessarily focused on nutrition for athletes, but you did nutrition generally. Um, but what do you think that your role could be as we move forward um, to be able to make that difference for us as a Caribbean people in understanding what we have and how we can use it? Uh, yes, um, it's a matter of uh, educating the public um, and, of course, the athletes. Um, oh, you, you have, uh, you, you grow all, I mean, the, 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 the roots and the roots and tubers that are excellent uh, sources of uh, carbohydrates that was uh, earlier mentioned. And of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Kevin mentioned, uh, the, the Kalaloo, right? So uh, in, instead, of, uh, instead of going for the imported uh, spinach, why not the African spinach? So why not, I mean, uh, in Jamaica, you call it uh, Kalaloo, and in Trader here, it's called Baji, right? Baji. So because uh, kal Kalaloo here in, uh, in Trinidad is, um, mixture of uh, vegetables cooked, mashed up together and all the vitamins killed, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, the, the African spinach is an alternative of the, of the imported spinach. You don't have to spend much money buying the imported spinach when you have the local one. And, uh, and apart, from, apart from, from that, right? Uh, buying whole foods, right? educating the public, telling them the importance of that. Why go and buy EPA and DHA? No, why not eat the whole fish? So since we say protein is important for the management of sports injuries, and then you are going to isolate the EPA and DHA from the fish and ask people to buy it because they, they are anti-inflammatory. 
Why not eat the fish? The fish has the protein and the fish has the DHA and the EPA. We'll fight in inflammation and we'll speed up uh, the recovery process because of the protein in it, right? So it is, uh, once again, it's a matter of educating the, the people, making, I mean, um, the nutrition more practical to the public, uh, uh, telling them, as I gave you the example of that 20, 30 grams that should be evenly distributed in each meal, giving you how many eggs do you have to consume to have the 30 grams and how many yo uh, Greek yogurt you have to, to consume. So, uh, and again, when it comes to athletes, I think it's quite important. It is, and it is your role, uh, Grace, to make sure that these athletes have their dietitians. Right, huh. the, the coaches, the coaches are not are not trained nutritionists. Agreed. Right? Exactly. Agreed. So, agreed. It's, it's exactly. just that you see, and Dr. Gupi Singh, I, I'm sure that you will understand this. When a team is being picked for athletes to travel, there is never ever a consideration that they would put, should carry a chef with them. Um, at one at one stage, I, I know that I don't know if Jamaica still does it, but I know that Jamaica had started that practice and it made a difference for the athletes that um, were competing because they didn't have to go in a, 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 a cafeteria where they were choosing things that they didn't like or tasted and say or didn't eat. I mean, I can personally say my own example in Seoul. Um, I, I went into the, the cafeteria once and the food just didn't taste good to me. And that was all I needed to do. And, and even although I had a good performance in the end, um, I was feeding on, I would go to Pizza Hut and have spaghetti um, and pizza, not a lot of it because my nerves and my, you see the mind and the body was in a different space. And so the, the, the need for food was not as important as the need for uh, mental strength and performance. And, and I think that's what happens when you get to a certain level. Your, your, your focus is really more it's driven that way. So the practice has to be developed early so that whether it is developing the taste buds, a different type of um, taste bud, um, understanding the impact that it has. And when, when they start to have the success, it will make a difference with how they then reach out for that. And the messages to the younger one, when they start to give that message uh, to say, well, this is what I think contributed to the performance because I consumed quite a bit of that and that helped me in this particular area. And, and so I think as we, I think we have been here for a long time. I know we had a lot of questions. I know some of you have been looking in the quest. Um, uh, I'm going to just take this last one. And it was, it is, can athletes go into cal caloric deficit in the middle of a season and be at, in, be at an increased risk for injury? I don't know which one of you would like to take that. Well, uh, definitely, uh, uh, in the middle of a season, <laughs> an athlete cannot cannot go in in, in a caloric uh, deficit unless he's in a in a kind of uh, uh, sports. He's I mean uh, performing in a kind of sports that requires him to lower his or her own body weight. Then okay. he has to go on caloric deficit, right? talking about wrestlers who have to go down to a certain category. Otherwise, no, we don't recommend that. You should, you should eat, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you are recommended amount of energy that should help you uh, boost your performance. Going on caloric deficit uh, can easily create the deficit of vitamins and minerals, which of yeah. course uh, you all know can uh, end up increasing the risk of uh, uh, injuries. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, uh, uh, if you don't eat a well-balanced diet, you don't concentrate. When you don't concentrate, there is no balance. No balance, you fall and you have injuries, right? So definitely no caloric deficit uh, uh, in, in the middle. middle. 
Well, sometimes yeah. though, sometimes <laughs> if I just add a, a two cents, sure. sometimes you do have to. So sometimes you have to make weight. You have athletes who have to make weight for particular. Exactly. In, in, so, but there's a safe way to do calorie restriction. So you must have a body composition, um, and that will measure your fat-free mass, your fat fat mass. So your weight loss then, and, and so it's fat mass, fat-free mass, and of course water levels. So your weight loss then comes from from a water reduction as well as a fat reduction, not from a fat-free or or what my protein levels are. And that's a safe way to do it, where you actually measure body composition and, and then post weighing in, for example, you get them rehydrated. And once you maintain muscle mass, which is your fat free mass, your, your relative risks of injuries are, li- are, are not necessarily increased. But of course, it, it, you need that nutritionist, you need a doctor, you need to have planning to do that. It's not just done ad hoc, because that would increase the risk of injury. Yes, the content of the diet um, is critical there in terms of what you're intaking to maintain a calorie deficit. So you would probably consume mostly like proteins, which is not going to store back off of the carbohydrates and the fats, which are things that will need to put on the weight, but you're still um, having the, the nutrients that you need to perform. I mean, just to give an example, we had an athlete once at a major championship um, potential medal contender who had changed his diet coming into the championship and changed that completely. Um, and he had lost weight and so forth. And then during the competition, um, he was wondering why he was on the performance. We're trying to tell him that boy, you really need to consume some calories and so forth. I think, and he didn't. He didn't do well, you know. So um, it's unwise, um, especially when it, yeah, it's going into um, endurance events or. Um, or power events that you track, that you do that, you know, but there's sometimes when you have to do it, you have to do it properly. Thanks, sir. So Dr. Bauer, I would like to hear your final, we're, we're wrapping up now because I think that everybody has been here for what, an hour and a half, fully, fully engaged. And, you know, you guys have been fantastic. I, I didn't have to think of questions to ask you because you you have just done so well. I mean, are there any last words you want to share with your audience? Well, um, all I can say is that um, it's quite important to manage inflammation after any injury. Could be sports, could be whatever kind of injury. So, we should uh, uh, put emphasis on anti-inflammatory diet. So increase consumption of uh, fish and seafoods and increase consumption of green leafy vegetables. Okay. And of course, uh, increase consumption of uh, canola oil mm-hmm. and that, that has uh, the, the omega omega. Uh, three uh, fatty, fatty acid and decreasing consumption of omega-6 oils. So we have to be careful with uh, corn oil, that's uh, omega-6, omega, omega pro-inflammatory. We okay. have to be careful with too much consumption of soybean oil, okay. higher of the omega-6 than the omega-3, omega mm-hmm. and increasing consumption of uh, nuts, and seeds, right? It could be sunflower, and uh, could be could be I mean uh, pam- pumpkin seeds, which I find ridiculous here in Trinidad uh, when people cook the pumpkin, they discard the seeds, not knowing that they are excellent sources of uh, good good fat. It's a uh, Caribbean food. thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So fighting fighting inflammation is. Uh, quite important and, 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 and but to wrap up you you brought up the, the question of get your rate uh, talking about hydration which I find uh, annoying here in the Caribbean is importing or producing purified waters mm-hmm. they take away all the vitamins and minerals rather the minerals I would say they take away all the minerals then you, you live in a tropical country. When you sweat, you lose not only the water, but you lose the minerals. So if the diet is not balanced, how are you going to get the minerals when the, water, when the minerals have been taken out of, the, out of the waters, right? So what I recommend is consumption of 
mineral waters, which you don't find, which you don't find, you rarely find in the Caribbean. So my recommendation is go for spring water, right? So long as it is not contaminated, even if it is contaminated, boil it to get rid of the pathogens. And this is what we want get rid of the pathogens and not the minerals <laughs> that the companies are doing. And yeah. the fully thing they do is that they add back the mineral and tell you it's alkaline water, but they are not <laughs> telling you how much of the minerals they added there to make it alkaline. Maybe you are exceeding your upper limit of certain minerals and you don't know you are killing your body. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, thank you. That's, that's your wrap. Well, Dr. Kubisin, I, I... As I heard the discussion about water, I know there's a lot of coconut water in Trinidad. Why not coconut water? I mean, I mean, why is it that we're not producing more coconut water to have as a natural? Can we have too much coconut water? Is it a thing that we can consume too much coconut water? Your closing remarks on that. I definitely love, definitely love the coconut water. Um, I think the biggest thing with coconut water is the life shelf life of coconut water. True coconut water has very little um, actually additional stuff that, that keeps it preserved. So, so very few preservatives. So the shelf life of coconut water is what you have to look at. But yeah, we love it. I mean, you know, in, in I think China does like coconut water for other reasons because it's a great mix there for 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 non-sporting drinks, but um it's also a really great hyd rehydration because it has all electrolytes, it has some carbohydrates in it. Um, and it's the right formulation. It's about 3% carbohydrates. So it's, it's not higher concentrated carbohydrates, but it's 3% of carbohydrates, which is great for in competition rehydration maneuvers. Um, and just, to, just to close, I think we have a lot of great people in the Caribbean who have a lot of great minds. Just this, this meeting alone shows how many great thinkers and sport that we have collectively. Um, and if we just continue to come together as a Caribbean uni uni unity and share knowledge, we can create a, a, a continued development of sports medicine, sports science, sports nutrition, sport physiotherapy, sport massage, and continue to support our athletes the, the way that they deserve to be treated and supported. So thank you for having me. Yeah, man, surely. And Dr. Jones, so we start, so we finish the circle. So we are finishing up with your few words and then we... And then... And I will say my few words so that here, yeah, Dr. Jones. Oh, All right. Well, um, just to just to rehash, so the topic was on sport injury, um, or sports injuries, and um, one what I like to look at is that um, when someone gets an injury, I try to view it as the person's body or that part of their body feeling to. Um, in the ability to cope with the stress that caused it. And so in dealing with sports, one of the best things to do is to try and prevent them. And that becomes in the athlete's preparation for the particular sport. And especially in sports where certain injuries are common, they should ensure that they engage in the appropriate exercise and training methods that help to, um, one, create ideal muscle strength and flexibility to be able to deal with those um, abnormal forces that are brought on by the particular sport. And in doing that, that should help them prevent injuries and, um, and recurrent injuries because you know, one injury tends to increase the risk of developing another. So um, preparation um, in terms of proper um, muscle preparation to participate in a particular sport and um, also the um, that was preparation in terms of muscle strength and flexibility, but balance and those things that help to ensure that biomechanically each individual is conducting their sports appropriately to help to reduce their risk of injuring um, a particular part of their body. Thank you very much. I, I want to also thank the 300 participants that came on today and listened to these wonderful speakers who no, are not a really very knowledgeable and, and we lean on them all the time. They do a lot of um, what I would say commentary service. When you come out of the Caribbean, you have to pay for everything that you do. These persons, they volunteer in all sphere, you know, from, from juniors all the way to seniors to, to even the professionals. And um, 
And so we want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank, we hope that our audience really gained a lot of information. We hope that we can continue this conversation. We hope that the, uh, the, the faculty of sport, even through the Center Costain Academy of Sport, will lead, lead the way in trying to develop um, more research that will be able to help us to, to see how we can, you know, we can get bottled coconut water on a regular basis without running out. I mean, we talked about not having enough, but if it's good for athletes, how can we drive that process in that direction? The sweet potatoes, right? I mean, how, how do we get our athletes? Um, just like when you have a baby and, and, and you, you, get the, you give the baby milk. Of course, if the baby is lactose intolerant, you start with something else and that baby adjusts to it. It is the same way in which we have been exposed with a lot of injuries and um, we have to start eating differently and thinking differently, taking care of our bodies so that as we go through sports and are finished with sports, that we do have um, maintain good health in our post um, sporting days. And so we really thank so much, um, not only the panelists, but I want to thank my team Mrs. Nadra Baptiste and Duarte, sorry, let me not say her full name, and um, Nadia James as well, and our, our guide in marketing who really helped us to, to put everything together. Um, we really want to say thanks to uh, the Mar Wendy and the marketing team for helping us to be able to do this. Um, I really am very thankful for your, the persons who joined. And this is just part one of a series of seminars that we would like to be able to have, to be able to talk to you and to be able to share information and, and as well to help to guide this path of creating more research available in the Caribbean, not just for the Caribbean, but for the rest of the world. So I thank you all, thank you for joining and have a good afternoon or a good evening, good night some places. <laughs>